I'm Owen Coggins, and this is Metal Methodology, a series of interviews with metal researchers about theory and method in our interdisciplinary field. With me today is Dr. Jasmine Hazel Shadrach, author of the book Black Metal, Trauma, Subjectivity and Sound, Screaming the Abyss, and Black Metal Musician in the band Denigrata. We're today going to talk about autoethnography and subjectivity in research. So welcome, Jasmine. Hi, thank you very much for having me. So already um, in introducing you as a musician and academic, this suggests an important aspect of the book as dealing with both analysis and practice. And the subtitle, Screaming the Abyss, promises a real intensity to the project. What was it that you wanted to investigate in the book? Oh, well, I mean, initially when I started... I was doing the wrong PhD. <laughs> so I was doing ethnography of the other women's experiences. And when I'm, I'm going through all of the all of the data collected and I was thinking to myself, but all of this has happened to me, too. So where does my voice and my experiences then sit in with all of this? So I had to make a quite sharp decision. So I decided to concentrate on my own experiences within extreme metal and black metal rather than you know just focusing on other women's experiences because you know at least that's got more of a history to it mm -hmm. and then I I kind of stumbled across autoethnography and that came from Dr Rosemary Lucy Hill bless her she sent me a gift in the post and it was Liz Stanley and Sue Wise's Breaking Out Again Feminist Ontology and Epistemology and in that book I then discovered this, this idea of you being able to use your own experiences as mm -hmm. data collection and analysis. But I needed to make sure that, you know, if that was my methodology, I needed a really strong, rigorous feminist theoretical framework. So I decided to use feminist psychoanalysis. So I used mostly, mostly <laughs> Judith Butler and Julia Kristeva. So that's the toolkit that I apply to the data collected from the methodology. And generally speaking, I think that actually worked out really well. And since then, I've had a lot of people actually contacting me, asking me a lot of quite serious questions about how can they use autoethnography. So I think in academic terms, it's a really young field of research, but it's really, really starting to gain some ground now. So I guess regarding those, the methods that you used for the book, what is autoethnography and how does it differ from, on one hand, autobiography and on the other ethnography that we were discussing in the last episode uh, with Gabby Riches. It's got more to do with ethnography, I think. I mean, autobiography is, is somebody just sort of telling their story, but there's, mm -hmm. no, there's no analytical rigour to it, whereas mm -hmm. autoethnography is specifically structured to ensure that it has a rigorous analytical backbone all the way through it because what's the point particularly if it's trauma based like mine is what is the point in dragging all that stuff up if you then don't provide the tools to start unpicking it so you can understand what on earth it meant because obviously this is born out of my experience of domestic abuse so at the time and this is probably true of a lot of people that, that have experienced that sort of trauma at the time you're just too terrified and frightened to engage with anything. You just want to get out. Mm -hmm. And when you have, if you are lucky enough to get out, you're still left with all of this, all these shadows. And it's really important to try and engage with them. And I knew that, that standard therapy just wasn't doing anything for me at all. And metal has probably for the last ooh, 21 years <laughs> has been the thing that I have always turned to to help me and I definitely know I'm not alone in that one and so I decided to find some like-minded people and Denigrata was born and that suddenly became the crucible that I could then pour all of that trauma into and because I was screaming I wasn't talking I felt a lot less vulnerable you know so and also I was screaming in Latin so I, there was a real buffer zone because if somebody was to sit down with me directly and ask me about what happened, I kind of go nonverbal and it becomes very difficult to, to, to talk about any of it. But mm -hmm. in Denigrata, just put my guitar on, kick my distortion on and away we go. And I don't have to 
become too preoccupied about the emotions that are sitting behind my screen because the screen does the work for me because it's really genuinely cathartic being able to just scream down the microphone without having to explain why you're doing it because mm -hmm. the music does that for you. So that then became this locus of intent that I knew I needed to make sure I used in my autoethnography. So ethnography would be studying other people's processes. And, uh, you know, we've, we've all done that. We've all looked at other bands. We've all looked at other experiences and wanted to engage with them. But I wanted to make sure that we were part of a cultural product, right? We were part of a, an aesthetic community of practice. And I wanted to be able to say, well, look, this is what we're doing. Let's have a look at what that means. Because it came from, it was born from trauma. It couldn't have been any other sort of metal, I don't think. It needed to be black metal because how I felt needed to be matched by the sound of black metal. So to me, black metal is what the abyss sounds like. And there was something really cathartic about positioning myself within that abyss because anything could happen. You know, I'm very aware of what the compositional structures are for, for black metal sonically and you know, musicologically. But, you know, just in terms of psychologically and emotionally, it gave me something that other forms of metal didn't have. So I knew then that ethnography wasn't going to be the one. Mm -hmm. Autobiography is just somebody kind of telling, telling their story. It's not offering any kind of rigorous analysis and doesn't really have a place in academia. Mm -hmm. unless it's something like creative writing but for where I am coming from a, a cultural studies background I, I needed to have that really strict rigor so that I was lucky enough to discover autoethnography which is based on, um, on the work of Jean-Paul Sartre. So it's about yourself and your experience and your engagement with the music but there's an analysis aspect with it that even though it's based on those experiences it can kind of contribute broader ideas about Absolutely. about the, those um, kinds of connections that you were talking about. The, the thing with autoethnography is that it enables you a, a kind of timeline. So you have this, you can look back into your past, which is interrogative, and then you can look at where you are presently, which is interrogative. And you choose moments that you remember that stick with you, good or bad, doesn't matter. And these become, they're called turning point events or epiphanic moments. And what that enables you to do is suddenly kind of capture a mise-en-scene, like a little screenshot. And then those little screenshots then become the thing that you apply your theoretical framework to, to try and discover, well, what was going on at the time? What, what really happened in that moment? Because you have your, you know, your main engagement of, with what happened because you're on the receiving end of it. You know, it's, it's your memory. But there are other intersecting things like what was the culture going on at the time? You know, who was involved with that? And you have all of these, like the history, the culture, the economics, all of these things start to kind of coalesce in these little snapshots. And you then realise that it wasn't just you. Mm -hmm. And that really helps to take the, the weight off you a bit. Mm -hmm. And also the, the beautiful thing, and this really does go against all academic training, is that it enables you to use your first person voice, you know, academically. And it's, it's accepted because if you're talking about trauma and your own experience, that's the place for it you must do that yeah in the way that you describe it there it makes me think that when you're doing ethnography with other people there's there's that difference there but the way you've just described it seems like it's actually a similar process but the the other person is yourself but in the past yeah and so there is that difference that you're that you're trying to kind of unpack and understand when you're doing ethnography there's the researcher and the researched there's always going to be a power differential there. But when you're doing autoethnography, you are the researcher and the researched. So it becomes this conglomerate where, you know, you need that academic rigour to make sure that you stay in line mm -hmm. and that it doesn't become this kind of solipsistic navel gazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So regarding the, the trauma in the title of the book, it's I mean, it's really unflinching in its descriptions of your own experience. And in the preface that you, you wrote, as you, you've just alluded to, um, rather than focusing on other women's experiences, which you did try initially, you realised that you were ignoring your own. Uh, mm -hmm. It became clear, this is a quote, that your own experiences contained important information that needed to be explored. 
Yeah. And so I was interested in that 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 change that you mentioned from kind of starting out trying to work with other people's experiences because when working on methodology for a research project choosing some methods always means choosing not to use other methods and sometimes that involves seeing what works and trying things out and realizing that they're not maybe capturing everything that you want to get at. Um, so can you talk a bit about how you arrived at that autoethnographic methods, uh, maybe including the processes of working through other ways of getting at the topic before finding this approach that, that really fit? It's really easy to get wedded to theorists that you're very passionate about. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when you realise that actually your work is going in a different direction, you have to let go. You can't afford to be precious about it. And it, <laughs> you have to have a bit of a stern talking to to yourself to make sure that you are OK to do that. And mm-hmm. everything about autoethnography just struck me as being the complete antithesis of all of my academic training, all of it. But also as a direct result of that, I felt like it was freeing because all of a sudden, you know, what I was saying was important and it meant something. And there was suddenly this this awesome you know, methodology that facilitated me to be able to do that that in itself was actually quite healing Mm -hmm. it's one of the things with 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 trauma is that your voice and your experience gets wiped away in favor of the abuser's narrative and you then become too frightened to say anything so what autoethnography did was it actually reinvested some love and focus on the significance of what I had to say and it was a it took a little while because I kind of had to break through a lot of those barriers myself but it felt like it was the most authentic thing that I could be doing you know I couldn't I couldn't talk about my experiences without it Mm -hmm. yeah and it feels like even at the boring practical level of research project there's it's interesting that there's that similar kind of framing of your, your expectations in your training and then kind of being able to break out of that to follow the questions where the where you knew that they needed to lead yeah exactly so you know these things start to take on a life of their own don't they and um you can't ever really i mean when you start your research if you already know how it's going to finish then what are you actually researching Mm -hmm. you know you have to be quite open-minded think well you know this this could kind of go in any direction but you know what actually ended up being a bit of a hate to use the word bible but bible uh for me (laughs) was um the second edition of Interpretive Performance Autoethnography by Norman K. Denzin. And it's not a large book, but it doesn't need to be. But I think I probably, I mean, I underlined virtually every <laughs> <laughs> every single line because it was, everything was gold. Like every single thing in this book was gold and I needed all of it. But that's what helped me to turn away from the way that academia is always done. And it's this constant reliance on the concept of objective reality you know it can't be good research if it's not objective and when it comes to talking about trauma and her story you can't do that you need to be able to have a mechanism in place that facilitates that subjective voice you've got to you can't Mm -hmm. otherwise you're just having other people research you and then you know you're you're, you're back in a disempowered position and that's not okay Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the next thing that I was going to highlight, actually. Uh, A crucial thing in the book is the idea of subjectivity. And it really seemed to me a good example of of where theory and method meet, as well as kind of incorporating that real life that is always involved in research, however much in the final product people might edit it out. But yeah, as you said, often in research, people talk about objectivity as a kind of benchmark for truth, mm. something that a supposed scientific method is is designed to achieve. But as you said, in terms of responding to trauma, um, you write in, um, early on in the book, this is a quote, it is OK not to recall everything in a scientific objective manner because trauma is not objective. And also that um, articulating trauma is is a really harsh and raw process so that, uh, again, another quote, being able to shrug objectivity off and put faith in your subjectivity is an important step forward. Um, And I think it's really interesting that that can perhaps be both in a in a therapeutic sense, but also in terms of the goals of the analysis in, in the book. 
So can you explain how the book responds to those ideas about research needing to be supposedly uh, objective uh, and how instead the value in this research comes from exactly from the focus on subjectivity? I mean, I, I kind of switch between the two you know, sort of standard academic writing where it's where it's applicable. But where I do talk about my own experiences, I then do switch to using the my first person pronoun because you need to be able to do that. And I hope I manage to do that with some degree of grace. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, because, you know, it's did I really want to talk about all of this stuff? You know, when I was writing my PhD, I, I you know, never even dawned on me that it would end up becoming my monograph. So I only ever thought really that my PhD supervisors would be the ones to read it. And then it got picked up by Emerald and they treated me so well. They were very sensitive to the nature of the book. And where I try to use my own voice, I needed it to be as honest as possible because you can't do autoethnography if you're not prepared to be honest with yourself. And that is why I think it's got so much in common with black metal, which is why I felt that those two things actually worked really beautifully together because you cannot be involved in black metal without some degree of honesty. You have to be able to look at yourself and go, right, what the fuck am I doing? You do not stand before the altar of black metal and don't know what you're doing mm -hmm. because you're just going to fall flat on your face. Or to be willing to investigate the really dark aspects of the self. Absolutely. And... It's a closed network of signification, but so is trauma. And you can just find yourself just constantly stuck in this, this loop where you the PTSD is just going round and round and you can't get out of it. And the only way I found to get out of it was creativity. I've got all this shit. What am I going to do with it? I've got to put it somewhere where I can make something beautiful out of something hideous. And that really was the baseline of, of what I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, it's not objective in terms of a, a scientific reality that we can go out and, and um, no, replicate no. studies or, and so on. Yeah. But it does have that wider applicability that it's it makes suggestions about possible connections between the kind of formal and emotional and structural properties of trauma and black metal that, that I think people can resonate with, even though it's, you know, you're, you're not making claims about necessarily other people's experience of black metal. No, I think you've provided a really rich um, account of, of how those things might relate that I think is going to be really valuable. Yeah, I mean, Stanley and Wise in the Breaking Out Again book, they talk quite angrily, I suppose, about the way that concepts of objective reality have been constructed and how masculinist they are. Mm -hmm. And there, there's an idea here that, you know, you can't do objective research without it incorporating more of a feminine or, you know, I know we're talking gender essentialism and it's all bollocks, but more of a, a feminine inscribed research methodology, which would be the incorporation of the subjective. And Stanley and Wise throw the whole lot out the window. They're not interested. They're really pissed off about it. And I took that anger and I then applied it to Screaming the Abyss because there's no point you getting caught up in arguments about what is perceived as objective reality when actually that's got fuck all to do with your experience of trauma you have to foreground your own voice I was never gonna make pop <laughs> it just wasn't it wasn't really gonna happen I mean I could but it had like held no interest for me whatsoever because I needed a sonic parity so what I was listening to what I was creating had to have a balance with what I was already feeling for mm -hmm. me I needed for there to be this <sighs> so one of the beautiful things about black metal is that it breathes and you know from, from my guitaring history I'd mostly played death metal and that doesn't really breathe you know you've got this kind of sonic space and it's it's just absolutely jam-packed <laughs> full mm -hmm. of riffs and drum rolls and you know the, the whole you know four to six minutes worth of track is just absolutely jam-packed and black metal doesn't actually do that. I mean, some does, but mostly you have this, this transcendental element to it that actually breathes with you. And that's what really fascinated me about it. I mean, it's, it's dark as fuck and that was perfect. I really needed that. But similarly, it had this, it moved. It moves with you. It doesn't become this, you know, this, just this block. I mean, you know, perhaps the second, a lot of second wave stuff, it's quite kind of monolithic, but 
you know that served a purpose and it's really awesome in its own way and then the way it's it's actually had the ability to adapt and change as time has gone on and there's a lot of you know sub genres of metal that have failed massively to do that and then they end up just eating themselves alive don't they they become mm-hmm. the Ouroboros and they just eat their own tail to try and survive mm-hmm. so going back to the links between subjectivity and, and feminist theory there's links there in terms of the construction or or maybe a reclaiming of the subject the i under patriarchy and also the idea that, that subjectivity is always relational. You mentioned earlier that you draw on um, Judith Butler and Julia Kristeva. So what did you find useful in, in their work that helped you understand subjectivity in the way that you were dealing with it in the book uh, and specifically in relation to black metal? Well, Judith Butler doesn't fuck about, does she? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, you can read Butler and you think you've got it. And then, you know, you've turned the page and you think, wait, I didn't get that. So you go back and you read it again. And it takes you time to really get inside her writing. You know, I I taught Judith Butler for years before I actually personally applied her work myself. But her work on corporeality and performativity, particularly those two. I mean, I I talk also about uh, one of the books that she wrote called Giving Account of Oneself, which -hmm. uh, which actually was autoethnography in all but name. But as concept, you know, the, the corporeality of, you know, one of the things that trauma does is prevents you from being in your body. Mm. And what corporeality does, for better or worse, positions you exactly in your body. So I knew then as a way of not healing, healing's the wrong word, but applying some degree of salve to the trauma engaging with corporeality and then I link that up with the way that the avant-garde composer Harry Parch uses it Hmm. because women are engaged with with their bodies anyway and then you look at a metal musician on stage you know they move we move our bodies you headbang you move with your guitar you move with the music whatever it is there is a real energetic corporeality going on and just that ability to link those two ideas together and then the performance of it I ended up really kind of breaking that stuff down because it wasn't just my gender performance because something really odd happens when I'm on stage as Denigrata herself, you know, this alter ego that had been constructed, you know, it's not, I couldn't go on stage just looking like me, you know, the everyday me that needs to take the dog to the vet and buy some milk. And it's just, just, that doesn't, that doesn't work. So we have these constructed costumes, these, these visages that we portray, but that really helps because you know, wearing the corpse paint and the antlers and everything else really enables your mind to get into that mindset so you can perform. But I'm on stage performing a perceived man's role, but then it becomes this kind of hyper gender weirdness, this kind of like non-binary weirdness as Denigrata herself, who becomes this composite of this masculine role and this, you know, this gendered, this female gendered body in it. Yeah. Yeah. That was quite fun. I enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. Not everybody else did, but I did. <laughs> I think some people were very annoyed that I was a front woman, not just a vocalist, but a guitarist as well. It seemed that those two things together elicited a very specific reaction. Whereas Manea, the other woman in the band who was doing coloratura soprano role and keyboards, historically they are inscribed as feminine roles. So I talk about this, I think it's in the fourth chapter. So she, you know, any sexism that she would have experienced at the gig would have been because she was presenting exactly in that way. But mine, because I'd messed things up on purpose, you know, Mm -hmm. I messed up these gender roles on purpose, was a completely different engagement. I've probably gone off topic, haven't I? Sorry. (laughs) How about? Oh, yeah, Judith Butler. Sorry, yeah, performativity. So, I mean, I really liked using Butler, but she was quite hard going. Mm -hmm. But I got a lot out of it. I'm really pleased with with the, the. how I applied her stuff to black metal Mm -hmm. but where I really felt like there was a theorist that spoke directly from my heart and it's Kristeva because Mm -hmm. her work is dark anyway and the first half particularly of Powers of Horror just felt like it was it was made to be applied to black metal because it's so fucking dark and she's really angry and there was nothing in there that I didn't go oh this is great (laughs) and so I was able to use the work on abjection that was a really that was a really big one, and also jouissance, uh, the deject and the corpse. You know, you've got this. You know, you're dressing up with corpse paint on, right? So you're a live person performing as a dead person, and 
some of the way that we were engaged with by audience members never other bands other bands were awesome but some comments from the from the audience it, it just kind of made you feel like a course <laughs> like well you know you're out here kind of like flagellating yourself on stage to um because that's the joy of the music right that's the joy of the gig but then this is Stuart Hall this is encoding and decoding just because we encoded this stuff doesn't mean it's going to be decoded in the same way right as, as, yeah. as frustrating as that can be so the music doesn't belong to you anymore then does it once you've performed the gig it's out there in the world it, you know the album is out there and it's for other people to engage with whether you like it or not mm. Yeah. Um, given that we've been uh, talking about objectivity and subjectivity, can you explain a bit more about um, Chris Davis' idea about the abject? Yeah. Between the object and the subject lies the abject. And that's where we are. So if black metal is so in love with the idea of the other, this transgressive other, it seemed really odd to me that that hadn't been engaged with in terms of Chris Davis particularly. Mm -hmm. You know, when we're going to be dealt with on stage, not as women, but as somebody who is breaking the rules and stepping outside of where we ought to be. You know, we're somewhere where we shouldn't be. And aside from the joy that we got out of doing that, you are akin to Nietzsche's madman in the marketplace, aren't you? And you're going to get nothing but shit and violence in response. So the work that Chris Daver had done on abjection actually underpinned a, a, a good majority of the work. I think chapter five is where I'm talking about the witch's restorative feminism in black metal. Mm -hmm. Because I think initially this word was thrown at us after gigs. Oh, you know, you guys look like witches. <laughs> I'm not really sure how that was meant, but it hadn't even occurred to us right before beforehand. And, you know, Minea and I looked at each other and went, oh, yeah, that's cool let's let's run with it so then that kind of took on a life of its own and we realized then that being aligned with this historically patriarchally hated powerful woman we could use that so we did i mean there's 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 something inherently ambiguous about being called a witch but the, that's part of where the, <laughs> that's part of where the power is mm -hmm. so we realized that you know I, I don't know whether it was meant nicely or as an insult does it matter so we just took the idea and we ran with it. But we knew then that the, the responses that we were getting on from us performing on stage, less so when you're just listening to the album, it, it had to be like a visual thing. Um, that what people were experiencing was this kind of abjection. So it was, you know, you're this othered concept, but you're even more othered because you're on stage in a historically masculine space. And you don't seem to care. Like, why don't you care? There seemed to be this, like, we were expected to be responsible for that. Mm -hmm. And quite honestly, we didn't give a fuck. What is important was the music. That's why we were there. We weren't there to, you know, have to confront other people's bigotry, I suppose. But it happened nonetheless. You know, we didn't turn up at a gig thinking, oh, well, we're going to experience some sexism today. Hooray. That's not that's not whatever we were thinking, but it happened nonetheless. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to be able to put a name to it. An abjection really was the one that fitted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's such an interesting relation in black metal between conservatism and, and radical transgression. But yeah, th thinking about denigrata as performance um also the book talks about catharsis and perichoresis mm. um, now you reference hunter hunt hendrix of liturgy a, a in relation to that, <laughs> um, um so what is perichoresis um and how does it relate to the denigrata performance and your analysis of it in the book i think it was because um the the idea of perichoresis is is oh god you're gonna have to forgive my terrible german pronunciation here are you ready <laughs> to try so this this idea of a total artwork because mm -hmm. you know black metal kind of ex exceeds its borders it's not just about the music it's the photography it's the aesthetic it's the video it's it's everything it's this atmosphere and hunter Hunt hendrix was able to give it a beautiful title and i was enormously grateful mm -hmm. um so i i was able to apply that to what denigrata was doing because you know it 
to ugh, to look at it in capitalist terms you know you're, you're looking for a this is horrible but a brand you've got to sell it you know we hope to make some money back on the album <laughs> and uh when you're doing your stuff online you, you've got to make sure that you have a particular aesthetic because the aesthetic has got to match the music has got to match your live performance mm -hmm. and so the term perichoresis as a idea of this total artworks that's specific to black metal was mm -hmm. absolutely perfect yeah, thinking about the abyss, it's sort of almost the black hole that draws everything into it. So, like, yeah. it has to be a total. Everything about it has to every, has to commit every to tiny, the, every tiny detail yeah. has to be fully committed to it. You know, and I think that towards the latter end of the book, when it gets to the epilogue, where it starts to deal more with the um, occult and esotericism, this mm -hmm. is in some schools of esotericism, the abyss is something to be avoided. Where I was actively going towards it, because actually that became this much needed space to build to create rather than it being something that you should be fearful of and should run away from mm -hmm. and so perichoresis really was the the term that incorporated all of those things all of those mm -hmm. tiny details mm -hmm. yeah so speaking of uh, hunt hendrix and some of that literature and that thinking i enjoyed how the book brings in those insights from from the black metal theory literature and while there's certainly a bit of crossover between black metal theory and metal studies in terms of the people researching it some people have kind of written in both styles mm. but the style itself of black metal theory is quite different and quite separate so how did you kind of engage with that that sort of philosophical and introspective and obscure black metal theory texts and how do they relate to um, the autoethnography and the ideas about subjectivity that you were working with? The stuff that's published specifically under black metal theory, again, can you know come across like a closed network of signification, which mm -hmm. is hard earned, I think, in a lot of ways. The language that's used in black metal theory is pure poetry. I mean, it really is the closest thing that you could possibly get to... <laughs> raising the ghost of the romantic poets right mm -hmm. but what that enables you to do is get it gets you closer to the beauty of it it gets you closer to the abyss to the void you i don't feel like you can use standardized academic language when you're dealing with something that is so terrifying and beautiful at the same time you need the poetic language to describe it otherwise you're going to fall short mm -hmm. the whole thing is apocalyptic that kind of apocalyptic element that idea of the, the liminality of the thin veil between death and life mm -hmm. that's where it's at that's where we're sitting with this that's where my subjectivity is with this in occult terms you know i i suppose you could look at what i went through as a a kind of death and rebirth mm -hmm. as Hunt Hendricks calls it this reannihilation, which I, I use quite quite a lot. As awful as it was, and I have come out the other side a very, very different person. You know, you think, well, that was the most extraordinary experience, even if it was damning, but I'm still alive. So that's got to count for something. And you need to make sure that you've got the language ready there to explain, to analyse. And black metal theory has that language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I was reviewing literature about how people have discussed metal and mysticism, I thought that the black metal theory stuff was was quite interesting because it was not an analysis of black metal and mysticism, but it was almost it, it shared similarities with the classical descriptions of, of mystical texts themselves in terms of how they're written yeah. and constructed. It was, like it was it was weaving another layer of art on top of the existing mm -hmm. art that it was examining. Would you say that like some black metal theory writing is autoethnographic in a way? Hmm. I really wouldn't want to say that or, or, or position that label on others' work. Sure. If, mm -hmm. if, if those authors want to say that, absolutely. Uh, I think certainly some of the, in Moore's Mystica, the chapter that Hunt Hendricks wrote in there, actually, because she's speaking so personally about li what liturgy had gone through. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, yeah, there, there were real elements of, of autoethnography in there. But I think she wanted to do something different with that chapter. So I really wouldn't. I would suggest that. 
but it's not for me to suggest. <laughs> sure. So the book is obviously centered on your experiences of black metal and trauma, but it also in an interesting way discusses disability, tarot, alchemy, and, and these other things which are important for your understanding of self in relation to black metal. Um, but also another interesting thing about the book is that it has a foreword contributed by Rosemary Hill. Um, and there's a text in the middle of one of the chapters by Amanda DeJoya uh, and an epilogue by Rebecca Lamont Jiggins. Mm -hmm. So I thought that actually the construction of the book itself is a really interesting demonstration of ideas about subjectivity in one way, talking about how black metal is inseparable from the experience of the person talking about it, um, but also in another way, thinking about subjectivity in a way that takes account of how we construct ourselves in relationship to other people. Uh, and in this case, the choice of supportive collaborators. So in addition to the seven main chapters, there's a foreword, a preface, acknowledgements, an introduction, and at the end, an epilogue and a peroration um, so all of this really, um, I thought it kind of wonderfully foregrounds as well as fragments the presentation of, of the, the speaking or the writing subject. So in terms of your method of writing and inviting others to write with you, how did you decide kind of what bits to include and what to leave out and the structure of the book as research? I really wanted to lift up other women's voices too. I think that initially it wasn't encouraged but I really I stood my ground mm -hmm. because it was really important to me to have those I mean I can't write about disability legal stuff like Rebecca can <laughs> you know and when it came to talking about like you know women in extreme metal I'd already made my position quite clear and it was really important to me to get Amanda in Mm -hmm. to talk about what her view is on that as well and it also meant an awful lot to me I really did to get Rosie to do the the preface and I realized then that actually what this book was doing was lifting up all of these voices because even though the book is about me and about my experiences I wanted to hold the hand of other women and go look let's go over here this is really cool and if I have any hope for the book at all it's that it helps people if they're in a shit place, I mean, there's even this in the further reading at the back, there's a lot of resources in there of, you know, how to recognise that you're in a, a dangerous situation. Where can you go for help? It was really important to me that that stuff was in there. So there was always this place to to go back to. So my wonderful editor, Jess, you know, she kept putting these footnotes in saying for further reading, make sure you go to this page. So it was it becomes this thematic that runs concurrently throughout the text that there's this supportive framework and that's what I wanted the book to be it wasn't mm -hmm. just a supportive framework for me yeah that in a way it's it's about you but it's for a much wider yes community of people for whom that's it's going to be really relevant silence serves nobody except the abusers and I'm you know time's up so thinking about kind of how this relates to to specific aspects of musical sound like obviously black metal is this total artwork as you've said but of course sound is is at the center i'm always really impressed with research that actually makes those really difficult connections between the real detail of particular musical sounds and ways of making musical sounds and their association with more abstract ideas and social meanings so to take one of the examples in the book, uh, you talk about the wolf tone. Um, <laughs> so what is that musicologically? Where does it fit in black metal music? And how does it relate to the ideas about gender and trauma and subjectivity that we've been talking about? I suddenly found that encapsulated in this, in classical terms, this thing that's very much not wanted. I actually found that it was this weird harmonic that was able to vibrate in such a way on a stringed instrument at least that it seemed to me to be the epitome of the abyss of this voidic structure that in orchestral music is something that's very much not wanted and it's a it's a pain in the ass in recording and they just want to get rid of it but in black metal when you start hearing these these strange harmonics pinging around off the vocals off the guitars you suddenly realise that there's this another layer of this abyssic engagement sitting and reaching its tentacles out through the recordings. We noticed it when we played live. And I realised that you suddenly had these 
extraneous notes that were in existence accidentally and I thought what a powerful beautiful thing that is and black metal made no attempt at all to get rid of them it was very welcoming of them and I just thought that's actually incredible to have this kind of musical anomaly that historically is something that's unwanted and black mm -hmm. metal has opened its arms to it and gone actually you really add something really fucking awesome to our music you are welcome here and it was just this sonic void that's what I really connected with and I realized the significance of that because that's how I felt so that it automatically connected with my subjectivity and I knew that there was obviously this um this magical esoteric history of the way in which that sort of thing functions and what it can actually come to represent so mm -hmm. I started to investigate that a little bit further and just to see what that could mean and actually did that as a research paper at a knockout conference I think it was only my second one so I was I was the noob <laughs> there <laughs> just turning it on my black metal stuff hello and um it was just really fascinating to listen to very established black metal tracks. And actually, you can hear, oh, you've got a decent set of speakers, you can hear it. You can hear it on Denigrata's album. And it's certainly something that in my current composition, I'm very welcoming of. Mm -hmm. Because to yeah. me, it's just these little examples of how if you start to try and control it too much, it will get away from you. Right. So it has this ability to exist in its own right. It's got its own sovereignty. You can't control it. But that also ties into the idea no. of it being. Nor should you. It's a sound that's been excluded and even treated with fear and disgust in some kinds of music. But then oh, yeah, definitely. giving it giving it its own power in, as a deliberate decision in black metal. Yeah, absolutely. I think that there's a real power to that because it gives you this kind of ethereal, otherworldly level to the music that does make you connect with its mysticism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're looking at sort of orchestral music and, you know, a quick search on YouTube will, will show you the amount of ways of, of trying to get rid of one of these, certainly in recording mm -hmm. studios. And it just really occurred to me, I was like, well, why do you want to get rid of it? I mean, you know, if you're sticking, you know, straight to a score and you have to play this thing that's been played like a million, million, million times before, then fine. But with stuff that has the ability to be more expansive and more experimental, then welcome it. Yeah. So finally, we always end. The last question is metal recommendations. Now, obviously, I'll recommend uh, Denigrata's album, Missa Defunctorum, Requiem Mass in A Minor. But I was also thinking about what else I'd recommend that relates to these themes that we've been talking about. So I have to go for the, the track, uh, uh, that's probably pronounced wrong, um, by the Dutch band Turia. Um, and what I love about it is mm. that ambivalence of the screeching screams um, that sort of suggest at the same time an affirmation, but also a dissolution of the self, or perhaps as you were talking about a kind of re or a kind of reconstruction. Um, so that's a good example uh, for me, as well as there being something really cathartic about the, the key changes in that track. So what's uh, what's your recommendation? Oh, you see, you really put me on the spot. Um, it's so hard to choose. Mm, my ultimate fallback every single time. It's Wolves in the Throne Room. Ex Cathedra, I think, is probably one of the most beautiful pieces of music ever written. That cascading main riff. And the way that the the blast and the burst beat work together to allow that tension and release, it just feels like waves washing over you. It's just masterful composition, if that's what you're looking for. And, you know, when I discovered Walls and I heard that track, oh, my God, I was obsessed. <laughs> and, you know, because it has elements of the Hyperborean, so the second wave, you know, the orthodoxy of black metal writing, but it was really transcendental as well because of this, this the way it breathes. It's not a particularly complicated riff, but it has some dyadic counterpoint in there between the guitars and it just moves and flows against itself. It expands and it contracts and it is the most extraordinarily beautiful piece of music and it's still brutal as fuck and it's just gorgeous. If I just want some really, you know, balls out heavy black metal, I'd probably listen to Archon Enforcers because that really is really fucking brutal. And I love it because it, you know, it gives you something different. The whirlwind journey is just gorgeous as well. But so, yeah, 
probably wolves. I haven't got over my my love for them yet, but that's probably my autism. (laughs) (laughs) Amazing. So the book Black Metal Trauma, Subjectivity and Sound, Screaming the Abyss is available now, published by Emerald. All of the texts and music that we've mentioned will be in a list in the video description. There's more information about the International Society for Metal Music Studies at the website metalstudies.org. Thanks to Heretic Temple for the riffs. And finally, thank you, Jasmine, for the great discussion. Thank you very much, Erin. That was awesome. See you next time, everyone.